Sometimes the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and if this concept is evident anywhere, it's with Giovanni Autotorde and his son, Ezio. Although his debut in Assassin's Creed 2 did not allow much screen time, Giovanni did receive more love and care from Ubisoft than the prequel movie Assassin's Creed Lineage. Here, we got much more information on the kind of man Giovanni was, the plot that commenced the events of the second game, and the conspiracy that unfortunately would bring about not only the deaths of two of his sons, but also his own. Although Giovanni may just be a small side character to the grand universe that is Assassin's Creed, knowing his story will help audiences understand what propelled perhaps the most important assassin in the era, Ezio, into action and launch him into the spotlight. Was Giovanni the seemingly tame and mild man we see in the second game? Was he unaware or ignorant of the events unfolding? or was there more than meets the eye? Let's take a look. By this time, my viewers probably already know that this franchise consists of an endless cycle of characters and their actions affecting other characters and their actions. So, although I could go unbelievably deep into the happenings before Ezio's rise, I am going to try to just stick to events that directly involve Giovanni, with maybe some ancillary information placed throughout when necessary. This video will consist of two parts, Giovanni's character history and a discussion about that character. Giovanni was born in Monte de Jone in 1436 to a father we do not know of. Although we do know that, along with his older brother Mario, he was trained in the assassin ways from a very early age. We also know that Giovanni specifically was taught and tutored in banking and other academic subjects as well, rendering him well educated for the time. After some years had gone by, Giovanni decided to leave the fortress of Monte de Jone and reside in Florence, where, in 1452, he met and married Maria de Mozzi. Four years would pass, and Giovanni would start his family with the birth of Federico. In 1459, he and Maria would have Ezio, and then Claudia and Petruccio in 1461 and 1463, respectively. During these years, around 1454, when Mario and the other assassins were dealing with the recently discovered Shroud of Eden, Giovanni returned to Monte de Jone. This shroud was yet another piece of technology developed by the Isu, or the ones that came before, and Giovanni was tasked with taking this shroud away from the region and somewhere safe. It is not known where Giovanni took the piece of Eden, but we do know it was later safeguarded by Ronaldo Verturi, also known as the Keeper of the Shroud, but all of this, unfortunately, is information for another time. One year later, in 1455, Giovanni came upon the six-year-old Lorenzo de' Medici, who had fallen into the Arno River. When I was six years old, I fell into the Arno. I soon found myself drifting down and into darkness. Certain my life was at an end. Instead, I walked to the sound of my mother weeping. At her side stood a stranger, soaking and smiling at me. My mother explained that he had saved me, and so began a long and prosperous relationship between two families, yours and mine. Giovanni jumped in and rescued the future nobleman, setting the foundation for the strong relationship between the two families for the rest of his and Lorenzo's life. In 1456, the 28-year-old Paola, an orphan daughter of two deceased assassins in Italy, was arrested for killing a city guard who abused her. Urging to defend one of his own's offspring, Giovanni represented her in court and was able to acquit her using a self-defense plea. After this, Paola joined the Assassin Brotherhood and opened up a brothel to operate out of. Her sister, Annetta, would also become one of the Auditore's housemates. Giovanni would then reveal himself to Lorenzo as an assassin and conduct several missions for him throughout the region in an effort to combat the growing influence of the Italian Templar Order under the rigid leadership of Rodrigo Borgia. 
Giovanni would spend many of his final days investigating and attempting to assassinate the Grand Master, but it would never come to be. On one such occurrences, he was able to take one of the Cardinal's guards to Alberto Alberti, a councilman of justice in Florence, who was then able to get the prisoner to disclose a plot to murder Galeazzo Sforza, the Duke of Milan. This plot was centered around the goal of having the alliance between Florence and Milan break as a result, and the Templars would then move in with a peacekeeping force to install a Templar leader in the city. Florence is weak now. We should take advantage of it. With your help, it's not part of my office to consent to the death of anyone. But my concern is the greater good of the Republic of Florence. Therefore, I am prepared to offer my spiritual support and military help to ensure order is maintained. Lorenzo tasked Giovanni with stopping the assassination, but he failed to do so, resulting in the death of the Duke and the loss of Florence's alliance with the city. Some time after these events, Giovanni had found out that Francesco Pazzi was perhaps part of the conspiracy against the Duke. Uberto, following Giovanni's recommendation, had Francesco arrested. The son of the conspirator, Vieri, would then come to hate the Auditore family and develop an especially intense rivalry and hatred for Giovanni's son, Ezio, whom was of similar age. At some point, Giovanni had gotten a strange feeling about the growing conspiracies around Florence and had Ezio deliver several letters throughout the city in order to inform others about what he believed was transpiring. As Ezio was away performing this task, Uberto, a secret Templar puppet, suddenly sent city guards to storm the Auditore Villa and arrest Giovanni and his two sons, Federico and Petruccio. Ezio, dumbfounded upon his return to an empty home, raced to his father's jail cell to inquire about further action. Hoping that Roberto could help him out of his predicament, Giovanni commanded his son to retrieve his assassin robes and deliver an exonerating letter to the councilman in order to be set free. Ezio accomplishes this task, delivering the letter to Roberto, who had promised his family's freedom and arrived to his father's trial the next day. Giovanni Auditore, you and your accomplices stand accused of the crime of treason. Have you any evidence to counter this charge? Yes, the documents that were delivered to you last night. I'm afraid I know nothing of these documents. He's lying! You need to get closer. In the absence of any compelling evidence to the contrary, I am bound to pronounce you guilty. You and your collaborators are hereby sentenced to death. You are a traitor, Roberto, and one of them. You may take our lives this day, but we will have yours in return, I swear we will! Giovanni was then tied with ropes around his neck to be executed for treason, along with both of his sons. He was, at that point, not only surprised that nothing had happened with the acquitting letters he had Ezio provide Roberto, but also that Roberto himself was at the head of the hanging, alongside Rodrigo Borsha. He finally realized that the councilman had been working with the Italian Templars for some time now. Although Ezio, who had just arrived at the scene, attempted to stop the hanging, he was unable to, and Giovanni, together with his oldest son Federico and his youngest son Petruccio, was executed. Giovanni is probably the closest thing we'll get to Batman in this universe. We have here a well-educated, rather intelligent, considerably wealthy, and very skilled warrior who works as a banker and legal representative during the day, and as a stealthy vigilante in a brotherhood of secret assassins by night. I mean, what more does one need to draw the comparisons here? Lorenzo is like his pseudo-Commissioner Gordon, acting as a political and government contact that provides him with his missions, and he seems to be alone in his burden of safeguarding Florence from the influence of the Templars. Piggybacking off of this point, I could not find any relevant information on any communication he may or may not have had with other Brotherhood members we meet in Assassin's Creed 2. We are made aware of the reasons for the existence of Paola, but other than her, we know absolutely nothing about his connection to the other members of the Assassins. You might have noticed how absent Mario was during the character history section, and you might have been confused or even disappointed about this absence. I was too. But this is apparently because even though Mario and Giovanni were both raised to be assassin members from a very young age, they held differing philosophies on how they should live their lives whilst associated with the organization. Where Mario desired more action and a more involved presence in assassin operations, Giovanni favored more authentic means of living within society by moving to Florence, holding a legitimate job, and wanting to raise a family. 
It is because of this sort of divide in thinking that led Mario and Giovanni not to speak to one another. This divide was so prominent that Ezio didn't even know he had an uncle when he arrived in Monte de Gione. Moreover, although Giovanni was planning on bringing his sons into the Assassin Order, he took his time and only began teaching Federico by the time of his death. This would downright shock Mario, who had to explain virtually everything about the realities of the world to his nephew once he had begun training him. In short, I'm not sure why we have almost no information on Giovanni's relationship with any of the Assassin members during this time. We aren't even privy to his relationship with Machiavelli, who was the grand mentor of the Italian Brotherhood. Baffling. We do know and see that he was an affectionate father, however, and very much loved his children and wanted the best for them. Ezio, remember, you need to think ahead. Don't wait for your opponent to move. Anticipate and surprise him. How are you, father? Good, good. He loved his wife very much, and we can perhaps understand why Giovanni took a different path with his membership in the Order compared to Mario. We can clearly see the aura of warmth his family possessed in the few cutscenes we do witness. During both the game itself and in the short film Lineage, Giovanni also seems to be very stoic in his interactions, remaining calm and collected when things go awry. I will admit this might be the case simply because we don't see enough of him, but I think it's still a reasonable quality we can attach to this man. Your blade won't be enough, assassin. What happens now is up to you. You have a unique set of skills, Giovanni. That's your name, isn't it? A set of skills I'd be delighted to have on my side. What side is that? The side that is going to win a war you don't even know has begun yet. The world is changing under your feet, Giovanni. Join us, and you may live to see it. Borgia. Yes, I know your name too. I also know how this is going to end. With your fantasy in ruins, an assassin's blade in your throat. We shall see. Surprisingly, Giovanni was also very skilled in the assassin ways. We do not see this in Assassin's Creed 2, because there he was executed alongside Federico and Petruccio rather early on in the game. All of his skills are made evident in the prequel short film Assassin's Creed Lineage, where we see that he was indeed a fine warrior and martial artist, he was an adept freerunner, and was well trained in investigative techniques. I was delighted to see this man actually working within the confines of Florence with the skills we knew he had. In Assassin's Creed 2, we only get to see the professional and legitimate side of Giovanni, and this somewhat weakens his presentation to the audience when this audience is indeed made aware of his Brotherhood membership, and witness no assassin behavior in the game. It is sad to contemplate the future Ezio would have had if his brothers and his father were still alive during his journey. Giovanni would have most definitely mentored and advised Ezio in his work, and Ezio would have been happier throughout his life. Although we aren't given this relationship in much of Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, or Revelations, we are provided with Ezio's relationship to Giovanni's brother, Mario. Well, for a little while, but we'll get there eventually. Giovanni was, essentially, the Batman of Renaissance Italy. He was an active member of the Brotherhood and attempted to foil the Templar plot that would lead to not only his death, but also his son's dawning as a man and journey to bring this ancient enemy to heal. Although he would never see Ezio go on to live the life that he truly wanted for his son, he would be able to take comfort in the fact that the world was made a better place because of his son due to the terrible tragedy that is his hanging. Until next time. It's so cold when you leave me alone in the dark. It's freezing inside of my heart.